to Creative Mornings Winnipeg. On behalf of the Creative Mornings team, we're excited to have you all here for another wonderful morning of enlightenment, conversation, and inspiration. and learning from others in hugs and high fives. We bring together people who are driven by passion and purpose, confident that they will inspire one another and inspire change in neighborhoods and cities around the world. Everyone is welcome. profit sector at both the national and the provincial level in areas of literacy, food security, and career development. Rhonda currently works as the CEO of Career Tech, a management-based not-for-profit organization that provides career education programming to children and youth from equity-deserving uh, groups. The vision for the organization is to inspire long, lifelong learning today uh, for, just, for a just and equitable tomorrow. Rhonda's work is purpose-driven. It is guided by equity, inclusion, belonging, truth, and reconciliation. It's about providing a piece of the puzzle that will lead to better outcomes for people who have been and continue to be impacted by the effects of colonization, oppression, and racism. With that being said, we are very happy to have Rhonda here with us sharing her knowledge and kind of her creativity. So without further ado, Rhonda, floor is yours. <laughs> Friday morning, I made it. I was telling a few people it took me um, some creative coordination to get myself here this morning because it's my right foot and I can't drive for eight weeks. So um, super fun. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, it is wonderful to be here with everyone this morning. Good morning. Thank you to our performers. I love starting my day with uh, local talent and uh, being introduced to new musicians and artists in our city. So thank you for, for making the time to be here. Thank you everyone else for showing up. I know our creative mornings are, are early mornings, so it, uh, it can take some doing to get here. So it's really wonderful to be uh, part of this great event. And I too have been to a few, so it's nice to um, be here again and uh, be here in front of you today. So, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Rhonda Taylor. I'm here to share some thoughts with you around the theme of ethos. But before I do, there's a couple of things uh, I want to share with you that I think also kind of connect to the theme in different ways. So last Friday, I uh, realized I was at a gathering with somebody else in the room that I completely forgot about. Uh, but it was said in Manitoba's gathering. And the theme of that event was cultivating joy. And there was so much wisdom, insight, and knowledge shared, and so much that resonated with me, and that really important reminder that we actually have to make time to find and um, participate sometimes in joy. We get very busy in our day-to-day -day lives. And so one of the very wise things that was shared by someone I greatly admire is Michael Redhead Champagne. Some of you may know Michael. Um, and he shared, you know, how he goes about preparing for a presentation. So one of the things he does is he tells a joke or two. And so he tells the joke not so much for the audience to get a laugh, but for himself to create that state of uh, being in a place of joy in everything that he does. 
So I was actually hoping he was going to be here today because I wanted to give him credit for uh, sharing that with us because I'm stealing that idea this morning and I've included it as part of my uh, presentation. So this is our first slide. Why do all witches wear black? Oh, because the answer's already out there. <laughs> oh, no, I know. I know. I know. It's on me. Okay. <laughs> so nobody can tell which witch is which. I was like, kill myself laughing right now. <laughs> so the next one is, did you know I taught a wolf to meditate? Now he's a werewolf. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> They got us laughing. It makes me feel good because as many times as I've prepared for this presentation, I actually laugh at those each and every time. <laughs> so it's been great. And I just turned off my notes. So isn't that so fun? Um, and then the similarity between the two, if anybody picked up on that, is that they're Halloween themed. Mm -hmm. Halloween is my favorite time of year. It's just around the corner. Um, so for me, it sort of tells me that I guess I was supposed to be the speaker for October. So it also then ties to um, something else that I believe in, which is that everything happens for a reason. I haven't quite figured out yet why this has happened, because this is just really annoying. But in all seriousness, and getting back to our regularly scheduled program, uh, I'm here to talk and share some of my thoughts around the global theme of ethos. And as I begin to do that, the second thing I want to share with you is actually how I ended up being here today, uh, talking to you and, and sharing some of these thoughts. And so the really short story is Christine Watson. I told her this last night that she wasn't going to be here this morning. Um, but the slightly extended story is that she asked me if I'd be interested in being one of Creative Morning speakers. And when Christine asks, I just say yes. Some of you may be in a similar situation. Um, it was a quick yes. Not a lot of thought or questioning went into it. I didn't ask for any additional information about how it works or how to prepare. It was just yes. Um, and it was yes because it was Christine and somebody that I greatly admire. So my quick yes garnered a quick, that's great, have a look at the themes and let me know which one you want to present on. I'm like, okay, no problem. She sent me the list. And then I started to go through the list and I was thinking, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into? Um, I went down the list and there was the theme of kismet, now, wilderness, critical, ethos, which I will tell you, I literally skipped over it because I didn't know what it meant and I never used it in a sentence, so how could I possibly speak about it? <laughs> and then I went through and finished off the list and I got to the end and I'm like, dang, what do I do now? It's like, I don't know what I can talk about. I'm like, can I go back to Christine and say, just kidding? And I'm like, no, I can't do that. And then I was reminded of a quote that resonates with me by Tina Fey. And it says, just say yes, and you'll figure it out afterwards. So I had already taken care of the yes part. That was easy. <laughs> now I was in the stage of figuring it out afterwards. And so, as my sister would say, just pull out the Google machine and see what we find. So I did. I'm still not sure I can use ethos in a sentence, but I'm here anyways. Um, just out of curiosity, and you can answer this, because I know you know already. <laughs> Uh, does anybody else know what ethos means and can you use it in a sentence? Okay, so maybe a slight yes or no, but I see some no's. Okay, so I'm glad to know I'm not the only one, right? Because I did, I had to look it up. Um, so in my search for meaning, what I found is that there are a few definitions that describe it. And the ones that I landed on that made the most sense to me, uh, particularly for this pr uh, presentation, was that as a, it's as a noun, it's a characteristic of characteristic spirit of a culture, era, or community as manifested in its beliefs and aspirations. Or it's the practices or values that distinguish one person, organization, or society from another. A distinguishing character, sentiment, moral nature, guiding beliefs of a person, group, or institution. Or character as the moral qualities distinctive to an individual. So I read those, I spent some time with them, I'm like, okay, ethos, I got it, thank you Google machine. Then I started focusing on the word from the perspective of values that distinguish one person from another and the guiding beliefs or moral qualities of a person. And so when I did that, I'm like, okay, so what does that mean now and what does it mean for the presentation? 
And then I got thinking about ethos from the perspective of community or society. And I thought within each of us, we wear so many hats, right? In our day-to-day -day lives, we're a family member, a friend. Some of us might be parents or aunties or uncles. Uh, we're employees, we're volunteers, we're entrepreneurs, we're activists, we're global citizens. So even within ourselves, we are a community. And within each of those roles, that we have, there is a set of values that distinguish us from one another. In our everyday lives, we have to tap into those values and guiding beliefs. Some days that's easy, other days it's not. Sometimes there's alignment and sometimes there's not. So the story I wanna share with you that demonstrates some of the values that are important to me um, is in my role as an employee. So I've got that hat on. And the story is connected to an employer that will remain nameless and a situation I found myself in with a boss, who will also remain nameless, where our ways of working with community and our values actually clashed. So as was mentioned, uh, thank you Lizzie for the introduction, uh, was that for about 20 years, I've had the honor and pleasure of working mostly in the not-for-profit sector, and I've also had the pleasure and honor of working with um, Indigenous communities um, from coast to coast and into the Northwest Territories. And so over the years, I've learned just how important building genuine trusting relationships is in that space, connecting with community at various levels, reciprocity, listening, time, and showing up. So as I developed more and more relationships, these values around relationship building became even more apparent and they were and are how I carry myself in these spaces each and every time. In this instance, with the unnamed employer, I was doing work that I really loved, like loved it, and with communities and people that I built relationships with over the years. Things were moving along nicely, conversations and plans were happening and underway, and we were a couple of steps away from putting things into action, which is another thing that I actually really value. So in that time, I had an outgoing boss and following close behind a new incoming boss. That's the one that will remain nameless. As part of his onboarding, he wanted an update on the work I've been doing, the plans that were in place, the communities that were on board, and so on. So when I finished giving him the update, he asked me, how did you decide what communities to work with? So I said, I'm working with communities and organizations that we have had relationships with for some years, and some of the communities are those that I've had personal relationships with throughout my career. His next question was, well, what criteria did you use to select the communities you're working with? So I just repeated myself. <laughs> His reply was, no, that's not how we're going to do this. And my response went something like, Where's the guy with his, like, yeah, <laughs> that, right? That was my reply. And then he continues to say, we're going to start at the top, and we're going to work our way down. So I replied, I'm like, okay, well, you're talking about, like, we'll talk with chief and council, we'll get them on board, we'll get this all figured out. He's like, nope, we're going to start with the assembly of First Nations. So if any of you are familiar, that's the large national body. Um, and we'll get their buy-in, and then they can tell us what communities to work with. So again, my reply, response, um, and very shortly after that, the call ended. So as you can imagine, I was uh, a touch stunned. What I heard went against everything that I had ever been taught about working with community, what I believed in, and I was really struggling to figure out how I was going to get myself out of having to work that way. Because one thing I also knew was that if I went to community and said, I'm here because the AFN sent me and they thought you were the best to work with, they would tell me to go away. Maybe not quite so nicely. <laughs> so while this inner turmoil was going on, I'm like, okay, well maybe there's a teeny tiny chance that he's right. And so maybe I need to take a different approach, but before I do, I'm going to do my own investigative research around how to approach this. So I called up 10 people that I'd worked with over the years in community to ask them how 
um, or ask them if I got about my work in the wrong way. Was there something else I should have been doing? Um, because if, if I had offended anybody, I certainly didn't want that to happen. So I explained the situation. I told, I told them what I was being told to do and asked for their advice. Any guesses on how folks responded? <laughs> well, not sure that I can swear during this presentation, so I won't. But one person that I talked to said, if I had come to his community using the, the approach, um, he'd have told me to be off. And that was pretty much what everyone said in a roundabout way. So I compiled all my notes. I set another meeting with my boss. I told him you know, the work I'd undertaken since the last time we spoke. And I suggested that going about working with communities in the way that he had outlined may not be the best approach. His response was, why don't you just listen? My response. Now, I'm really in a pickle because he's forcing me to do something that was so set against everything I'd learned and how I'd been working and what I was most worried about was doing damage to the relationships that I had in place over the years. Because the other thing I've been told throughout my career is that it takes years to build genuine, trusting, authentic relationships and only a split second to destroy them. And I was like, I can't go there. So I started to drag my heels a little bit to buy myself some time as I tried to figure this out. And it didn't actually take long. So the place that I got to in this very short period of time was that I'm going to have to quit my job because I cannot do what he's asking me. So I didn't want to do any damage to the relationships that I had because they were way more important to me than any job would ever be. So, every, so my evenings, my side hustle in the evenings became trying to find myself a new job because I needed out and I needed out quickly. Well. As it turned out, just a week later, my boss emailed me and said he was coming to Winnipeg with our new HR person. And immediately, I knew why. So if anybody's thinking in their head, oh, did she get fired? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> you would be correct. He showed up in my office, slid my walking papers across the table, and that was it. But for me, it was one of the best days of my life because now I was no longer going to be forced to go against what I believed in and what I've been taught. The relationships I had with communities and people were going to remain intact, and I was leaving knowing that if he wanted to work his way, he was going to sink his own ship, and I was so happy I wasn't going to be on it. After I packed up my desk and shook his hand, I went and had lunch with my mom and spent the next three months being intentional about clearly defining what was important to me, where I wanted to work, how I wanted to work, and who I wanted to work with. And in that time and at that place, there was going to be no negotiating just based on what happened. So I'm like, OK, I know that. I know where I want to go. And I was not going to put myself in a position of taking a job for the sake of a job. The job had to align with what was important to me. And if it didn't, then it just wasn't the job for me. So I had about three months of you know, doing this kind of work, and I was halfway through. And so my reflection was done, my intentions were set, what I valued was, was defined, and it was time to really start looking for a new job. So I hung out on the Indeed job board for a while. I scoped out positions and opportunities on LinkedIn. I scrolled through postings on Charity Village, and then I was like, whoa. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be unemployed forever. <laughs> because nothing felt right. I didn't see fit. I didn't see alignment. And now I was a little nervous and a little scared. So I spent a moment uh, in a small place called Pityville. But once that pity party was over, I set my sights on a different approach. I went through my LinkedIn connections and reached out to people that I knew, that I trusted, that were doing work I wanted to be doing, and I asked to meet them for tea. I told them my story, told them the place I'd gotten to, and asked if they knew of any opportunities that would align, or if they knew anybody that in their networks they'd be willing to connect me with. So that process did take a few weeks for sure, but in the end, I said yes to a three-month contract position that turned into two years of work. 
I moved from there to another amazing contract and then to where I am now with Career Trek. And so I leave you with these questions. When you think about your own personal values, your ethos, there's me using it in a sentence, <laughs> your beliefs, the many hats that you wear, what drives you? What guides you? What is important to you? Are there places, spaces, and instances where you'll negotiate or not? How creative are you willing to be in those instances? Is it worth it? And what are you willing to give up, walk away from, or lose in order to stay true to yourself? So before I wrap up, I leave you with one final quote that guides me every day, and that is, be fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. Thank you, everybody. You've been spectacular. <laughs> <laughs>